How you doing everyone? Welcome to Anatomy Lecture number 10. This is the final lecture in this series. Uh, as always, the content that we're going to cover today builds upon the previous nine lectures. So please make sure that you are familiar with that content before you uh, dive into this stuff. Today, we're going to talk about the knee joint in a little bit more detail than we have already. We are going to talk about the muscles of the lower leg. There's not too many we want to refer to there. And we're going to talk a little bit about the foot. <clears throat> Uh, before we do that, I just want to do a quick recap uh, on joint classification. Now, we did a whole lecture on this. I'm just going to do two slides on it here now. But just a quick recap. Joints um, can be classified according to, in, in different ways. We focused on structural classification. And according to structural classification, there are three different types of joints. Fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints and synovial joints. Fibrous joints and cartilaginous joints are similar in that they are um, where two bones joined together, two or more, more bones joined together, joined by tough connective tissue. In a fibrous joint, it is essentially fixed. There is no movement allowed, uh, permissible at that joint. A cartilaginous joint is also tightly connected, but there is limited movement allowed at a cartilaginous joint. Our focus, however, was primarily on the synovial joints. So let's just do a quick recap slide on the synovial joints. They are the most common type of joint in the body and they are designed to allow for smooth movement between adjacent bones. There's six types of synovial joint in the body. We've got a ball and socket joint, uh, such as the shoulder and the hip. We've got a hinge joint like you'll find at the elbow and the knee. We've got a pivot joint. Um, a good example of that is the joint between the atlas and the axis. That is cervical spine, uh, cervical vertebrae number one and two, uh, or the top of your neck there. What allows you to nod or shake your head as if you're saying no to allow that rotation to occur. We have a condylar joint. <clears throat> which is uh, a type of joint that is found in the wrist and the ankle. And very similar to a condylar joint, but allowing more movement, we have a saddle joint. And that is a, an example of that is your thumb. Finally, then we've got a gliding joint. And that's where we have two essentially flat surfaces meeting uh, and there is limited sliding motion allowed there. So an example of that is the joint between your collarbone and your scapula or a facet joint in your spine um, would be a good example of a gliding joint. Synovial, synovial joints have certain specific characteristics that are unique to the, to the synovial joint and they're pretty much all geared towards facilitating smooth frictionless or low friction movements. So an all synovial joints will have an articular capsule that seals the joint in. On the inside of the uh, articular capsule there is a layer called the synovial membrane and that synovial membrane secretes synovial fluid. So all synovial joints have this articular capsule lined with a synovial membrane which secretes synovial fluid into the joint. Finally, the bones that meet in the joint, uh, in the synovial joint, will be lined with articular cartilage at all, in all synovial joints. Then some synovial joints have specific characteristics unique to them. Some have menis menisci or discs in the joint to provide some extra structural support and to further aid in smooth movement. And then some joints will have bursae located in them. Bursae are small sacs that are filled with synovial fluid and they're generally located where um, uh, where I where parts of the body might rub off each other or there might be areas where there's increased friction and these bursae these little, like little cushions of synovial fluid are located in these areas uh, with the aim to reducing friction in those areas when we're looking at the ankle there there's a couple of nice uh, examples of uh, bursae that we can see very very clearly so I'll highlight those in a couple of minutes uh, right okay sorry I just see there at the 
the title at the top of that slide is incorrect. Uh, what today? What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a couple of muscles. We're going to look at the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the tibialis anterior. They are all muscles in the lower leg. We're going to look at some specifics of the knee. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, cruciate ligaments, the ACL and PCL, and the medial and lateral collateral ligaments. We'll also look at some structures around the ankle and foot, the Achilles tendon, and the plantar fascia. Okay, so let's dive into it. And for the last time this semester, we should go back to our model <clears throat> and have a look at our gastrocnemius. That's the first muscle we're going to look at. So the gastrocnemius is what we would normally or traditionally think of as our calf muscle. Uh, oh, I don't want to move them like that. Uh, our gastrocnemius has two heads. If I was to select the two of them there, what we're looking at there is that kind of teardrop shaped muscle at the back of your, the posterior surface of your lower leg, um, giving us this, uh, giving us your calf muscle. Now, if I just isolate one of them on its own, what we see, oh, not showing me the bone. Um, fade out the others there what we see is the gastrocnemius muscle originates above the knee joint on the femur so we can see there uh, it originates uh, on the distal end of the femur the part that's furthest away from the midline of the body the bone the, sorry the, the muscle crosses the knee joint uh, and it runs down the bulk of the muscle is at the top third of your lower leg and then it joins on to your achilles tendon which we'll have a look at in a minute and it inserts onto your heel but your gastrocnemius what we would normally think of as of your calf muscle there it crosses the knee joint and technically through the uh, achilles tendon it crosses the ankle joint there so it's involved in movement at both joints at the knee it is involved in knee flexion so bent decreasing the angle of the joint at the knee there pulling that foot up behind you so it does that in conjunction with the hamstring muscles the sartorius muscle that we have mentioned in previous lectures uh, they all work to flex the knee at the ankle the gastrocnemius muscle um, works to plantar flex the ankle so remember that's a specific movement uh, that we talk about at the ankle plantar flexion is pointing your toes away from your body very very important for walking for running for jumping movements the ability to plantar flex to push your toes down into the ground uh, and allow you to, uh, to to raise your body up lift your body weight off the ground through your ankle joint um, we also have if I exit out of that so that's what I said when we, we traditionally think of your calf muscles we mo most people will think of their gastrocnemius however there is another muscle here that's quite important if I highlight it here you'll see it light up it is called your soleus muscle it lies deep to your gastrocnemius and your Achilles tendon so if I strip that uh, back out take that layer back off what we see there all of a sudden is this big muscle underneath the gastrocnemius there your soleus muscle your soleus muscle originates um, on your fibula and your tibia so it does not cross the knee joint if we isolate it there and have a look we can see that there is an origin on the tibia the large weight bearing bone of your lower leg there and also on your fibula this the other bone that's in your lower in your shin and it run the belly of the muscle runs down the back of your uh, posterior surface of your 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 lower leg, and it inserts onto your heel through the Achilles tendon as well. So your if I pop your uh, the Lex layer back up, we see the Achilles tendon. If we zoom in there, we see that your soleus tendon joins into the Achilles tendon here. Uh, so we've got the gastrocnemius and the soleus connected to the heel via the Achilles tendon. This bone down here is your or, sorry, sorry, calcaneus bone. It's the specific name for your heel bone. So the soleus muscle connects to the calcaneus via your Achilles tendon, but it differs from the gastrocnemius in that it does not cross over the knee joint. The soleus muscle originates 
below the knee joint there. So it is not involved in any movement at the knee. It is only involved in movement at the ankle. So it's also involved in plantar flexion of the ankle there. So th that plantar flexion movement. So if you wanted to target your, 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 your gastrocnemius or your soleus, uh, exercises like a calf raise uh, would be a good, good exercise to target those muscles. Um, a slight digression, but I think it's important to note at this point is that when you're trying to stretch your calves, because we've got two uh, fairly large muscles here, your gastrocnemius and your soleus muscle there, um, they need a, a different stretch to target them. The gastrocnemius muscle crosses the knee joint and the ankle joint. The soleus only crosses the ankle joint. So if we do a kind of a, a traditional stretch for the calf where we pull the toes up towards us and, and bend over to reach down towards our toes, we are targeting the two muscles, but we can target them individually a little bit better. If we keep the knee straight, the gastrocnemius will be at its full length, especially if you pull the toes back in towards it. So any calf stretch that is performed with the knee fully extended is going to target the gastrocnemius a little bit more. If you want to isolate and stretch the soleus muscle, you need to perform your calf stretch with a slight bend in the knee in order to, to, um, to take the gastrocnemius out of it a little bit. And that allows you to further isolate and stretch the soleus muscle underneath. So there's plenty of variations of calf muscle stretches or calf stretches there that you can do with your knee either extended or slightly flexed to target those different muscles. I know if someone uh, hasn't exercised for a while or if they start to run, uh, they will often experience DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness or pain uh, in their calves after they've done those exercises. Um, and for me personally, I always, fi always find that it's worse than my soleus. So the pain I get after a long run or a, or a run that I'm not used to doing will be lower down here uh, in the lower portion of my leg, meaning that it's my soleus that's a little bit sore, not my gastrocnemius. So knowing and being able to target those different muscles with different stretches is, uh, is useful for a warm up, uh, also for a cool down and perhaps for a little bit of stretching that you might want to do uh, after exercise. Okay, the soleus and the gastrocnemius we've said join into the Achilles tendon there. So we've got them all selected. The Achilles tendon is the largest uh, and strongest uh, tendon in the body. It attaches the soleus and the gastrocnemius to the heel bone. Um, it's a very, very important tendon, but it's often one that can be injured quite easily. So there's, if there's any excessive load placed through this, um, it can... Um, it can sprain or strain uh, or tear or rupture. Um, so a tear might be a partial um, partial bit of damage, maybe not going all the way through it, you might tear part of it. A rupture is when it's completely torn and one end of it separates from the other end of it there. Um, it is, I, 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 it's, I won't say it's a common injury, but it is. it does happen, it can happen frequently and it can happen quite easily. So as I said, any, um, jumping, bounding, or any exercises that place a very heavy eccentric load on the calf muscles. So an eccentric contraction is when they are lengthening under tension. So an eccentric load would be like when, you, if when you're running and when your foot hits the ground, you are putting an eccentric load through your, um, through your Achilles tendon into your calf muscles to try and absorb the shock of the landing. And then you're trying to press it, contract them again to press off as you, as you run forward jumping, landing, bounding, any of those uh, can put your Achilles uh, at risk. Now, I hope you're not squeamish because I'm going to jump back to uh, this here. Uh, and if we look at this from the current slides, we've got two examples here of, uh, of, of incidents that were caught on camera. So hopefully you can see and hear this uh, as, as we play. So we'll look at this first one here. So they're both uh, two people um, exercising, uh, one at home, one in a park, and they're doing, you know, body weight exercises, but both of them are, play are, are, are it's very dynamic. So they're placing, uh, they're moving reasonably quickly and they're 
both placing a fairly significant load through their Achilles uh, muscle. Now, I'm not sure of the conditioning, how well experienced these people are. Have they trained? Have they got a good training history? Have they, um, are they coming back from an injury? You, you know, is this the first time they're doing it? None of that information at all. So I'm not suggesting that this is definitely going to happen if you do these exercises, but two examples caught on camera. So we'll look at this one here, the girl in the blue shorts first. Um, if you're squeamish, look away for about 30 seconds. Um, if you want the full effect, make sure you've got your volume turned up. Nice. So we see there as this foot hits the ground, you can see the recoil in the calf muscle there as the Achilles muscle gave way and you can quite clearly hear it. It's a loud pop. Um, from that muscle that's the Achilles rupturing so it's like a, it is very much like an elastic band that you have stretched too far the elastic band has snapped and there's a recoil out of it there's a noise and there's a recoil out of it this second video here is similar again volume up for this one so a home workout here you know fairly innocuous what the lady is doing but she every time she puts her foot back she's putting a bit of her body weight into it and she's eccentrically loading up the calf oh oh shit and there we go that oh, one is shit. quite loud you can hear oh, a fairly shit. significant pop oh, out of that one there so two examples of the achilles being damaged there just for well for interest um the um the 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 it, 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 sorry the achilles being ruptured like that is a serious injury but it is one that can be um can be repaired so uh, what the surgeon will do will require surgery to fix it if it's been completely ruptured um, the surgeon will go back in and simply sew the two ends of the Achilles together the person will be in a boot to keep the ankle fixed um, in place while it heals and they'll be on crutches for a, a good bit of time and then there'll be a bit of rehab to bring it back to normal but I know plenty of people who have uh, had uh, an Achilles rupture and have come back and are fighting fit uh, after the fact so that's the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the Achilles tendon. There's one more muscle I want to refer to, and that is your tibialis anterior. So from the name, you should be guessing that we're spinning around to the front. Uh, the tibialis anterior is would be would form an antagonistic pair with your gastrocnemius and your soleus muscle. Uh, so um, your tibialis anterior muscle is this guy here. It runs from the uh, top of your tibia, tibialis anterior, it runs along the front surface, the anterior surface of your tibia, and it inserts onto your cuneiform, which is one of the bones uh, in your foot. So we see there, it runs down and connects onto to the cuneiform bone there. The job of the tibialis anterior is to dorsiflect your foot. So the opposite of, uh, of plantar flexion, if you wanted to pull your toes up towards you, you would flex your tibialis anterior muscle, muscle to pull that, uh, that, that the toes up towards your shin. So that's why it works as an antagonistic pair to your gastrocnemius and your soleus. They look to plantar flex the ankle. This looks to dorsiflex the ankle. So as we contract, the tibialis anterior it is the agonist dorsiflecting the ankle and in order to do that your uh, the uh, antagonist muscle must relax and allow themselves to lengthen then to plantar flexus the roll your foot the rolls are reversed your tibialis mu anterior muscle relaxes and lengthens the ga the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles become the agonist and they plantar flex the the foot um Again, an interesting one with this uh, is shin splints. If anyone has, has suffered from shin splints, one possible explanation for, uh, for shin splints is the fact that this tibialis anterior muscle is connected to your tibia, to your shin bone. So it, it originates up here on the top of your tibia, but there are, is connective tissue the whole way down your, your shin bone there. 
And when someone, again, if it's if unaccustomed exercise, if they start exercising, walking, running, or sometimes to do with the way that a person runs or walks, they uh, tend, they might pull their toes up a little bit too much, causing this muscle to work a bit harder than it needs to. to. Um, and the point where this muscle connects onto the bone there can be a little bit of irritation, inflammation, swelling and pain in that area there. And that's what's called shin splints. So one possible explanation of shin splints is this tibialis anterior muscle pulling on the connective tissue uh, where it connects onto the bone here, causing pain, inflammation <clears throat> and um, swelling uh, in this area here. Uh, shin splints can be commonly treated by using a an insole in your shoe so if you put a little insole in your heel it lifts your heel up slightly it puts your foot in a slightly more plantar flexed position uh, which lengthens out your tibialis anterior muscle and takes a bit of the pressure off it um, and can it can help to alleviate um, uh, shin splints okay so that's the last muscle that i want to talk about next i want to talk about some structures in the knee so we've 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 looked at the um the muscles around the knee uh, on the front we've got the quads on the back we've got the hamstrings the gastrocnemius the tibialis anterior uh, and we've also looked at this connective tissue here in a previous lecture we've got the quadriceps tendon which becomes the patellar ligament uh, where the where the quads the patella and the are, are joined onto the tibia at the front here if we zoom in, we want to just look at a couple more structures in the knee. Some of them we mentioned in the recap earlier on. I'm going to take out the, um, the musculature at this point. So what we've got here is the knee joint, a hinge joint. We can see quite clearly either end of these long bones is, has got a covering of articular cartilage, something that is specific to synovial joints. We can see the back of the patella is also lined with that uh, articular cartilage there to help it move smoothly over the joint. If we put in some connective tissue, uh, we pop it in. First thing we see there is we've got some discs. So these are specifically our menisci, meniscus uh, in your knee joint there. So we've got a medial uh, on the middle toward the midline and a lateral meniscus of the knee joint there. So they're there to provide further support, structural support uh, and to assist in the smooth movement, uh, smooth movement at the joint. So that they are unique to um, to your knee. So if you hear someone saying they've got a torn meniscus, they are referring to one, usually referring to either the lateral um, or the medial meniscus in the knee. The other structures I want to bring to your attention are your cruciate ligaments. Now, one of them is kind of difficult to see. We can see the front of it here. This is your anterior cruciate ligament. It is named because it um, starts at the anterior surface of your tibia there. It runs through the knee diagonally and it inserts into the posterior surface uh, of your knee there. So it crosses over from front to back. Your, your anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments form a little kind of X in your knee, if you will. Uh, the job of the anterior cruciate ligament is to prevent the tibia from sliding out in front of the femur. So if we imagine your uh, knee joints here, you want your knee to flex and uh, extend like that, but we don't want the lower part of your knee to slip out in front. So your anterior cruciate ligament holds it in place like that. We've also got your posterior cruciate ligament, which is a little bit easier to see here. Uh, and that does a similar job, but it's, this time it's preventing the knee from going back behind. Uh, so the two cruciate ligaments are providing structural support to the knee, preventing the tibia from shifting forwards or backwards. Uh, in the, the knee joint. Now there are two commonly injured um, uh, ligaments. If there's, a, if there's an excess um, rotational movement of the knee, you can damage your cruciate ligaments. If a tackle from behind might shunt your, your shin out in front while your foot stays put. If you catch your foot in the ground while you continue to move, it can all cause problems at your knee and cause damage to your cruciate ligaments. So like we mentioned with your Achilles, they can be torn or they can be ruptured uh, either individually or both of them together if you get a bad injury, but they can be repaired. So we have a quick uh, video here just to look at that.
The anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, is an important stabilizing ligament of the knee that connects the femur to the tibia. It is the most commonly injured knee ligament and is frequently injured by athletes and trauma victims. ACL tears are caused by lateral rotation, backward displacement, or sideways impact of the knee while the lower leg is in a stable position. This can happen during a pivot or a jump. Sports associated with ACL injuries include alpine skiing, soccer, American football, rugby, basketball, and tennis. However, American football players sustain the greatest number of ACL tears from contact injuries. Statistics show that there are between 100,000 and 200,000 ACL ruptures per year in the United States alone. When the injury occurs, the patient would feel a pop in their knee, experience acute swelling, and a feeling that the knee is unstable or giving way. This causes instability with movements such as squatting, pivoting, and stepping laterally, and activities such as walking downstairs. The management of ACL tears depends on the extent of the damage. Acute management consists of rest, ice, compression of the injured knee, elevation of the leg, and the use of crutches. Over-the-counter painkillers and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs provide effective short-term pain relief. The patient may also require reconstructive surgery with a hamstring graft or patellar graft. Okay, so we have a, a nice little video summarizing uh, the cruciate ligaments uh, repair there. And like with the um, like with the Achilles injury that we mentioned earlier on, cruciate ligament repair is excellent these days. So it is not it is a probably a season ending injury for an athlete, but it's not a career threatening or ending injury. Uh, also interesting to note that cruciate ligament injuries are more common in females uh, than they are in males. So if you're coaching or working with female athletes, just to be aware of that. OK, uh, very, very quickly, while we're talking about those ligaments, if we add in a bit more uh, connective tissue on the knee joint here. Uh, what we'll see is that there are a lot of other ligaments uh, around the knee joint there to stabilize it and hold it in place. So all of the individual points that you can see there are ligaments mostly that are holding the knee joint in place. We've got one here uh, called the um, lateral collateral ligament and on the inside here we've got your medial collateral ligament so lateral and medial collateral ligaments they're two injured ones that are also uh, commonly injured they prevent your knee from uh, bending to the side too much and they're often sprains again if there's a if there's a, an impact to the side of the leg or if there's excessive rotation those ligaments can become damaged as well uh, here, just to highlight it, we've got the suprapatellar bursa. So that is a bursa, a fluid-filled sac there to prevent friction. Um, supra above the, the patella, above the knee joint. So imagine then if you if you have your quadricep muscles and tendon all uh, in this area, that little cushion there reduces friction between those other soft tissues and the bone uh, in that area. Okay, we are nearly there. The last thing I want to cover today is... Um, the uh, fascia down in the on the base of your foot okay so if we we have uh, covered literally covered from head to toe the last thing i wanted to show you is on the base of the foot here so if we zoom in and look at the ankle uh, again we see that there's a very very complex series of um, ligaments to connect the bones of the foot together and hold everything in place we can see some bursa there's a bursa on the ankle there uh, we can see more around the back here. There's some on the, on the back of the heel there to try and, re again, reduce friction and wear and tear in those areas. But what I really want to show you, or the last thing I want to show you is on the base of the foot here. So if you look underneath the foot, we've got this thing called the plantar fa uh, fascia. Fascia is a general term that you, is used to describe any sheet of connective tissue in the body. The plantar fascia is a sheet of connective tissue that connects the, the heel, the calcaneus, to the bones of your foot at the front there. And it kind of <coughs> keeps, your uh, keeps the arch in your foot. So this band of connective tissue connecting this um, posterior portion of your foot to the anterior portion here keeps that arch 
in your foot in position. Uh, the reason I mention it is because there's a thing called plantar fasciitis. Um, so again, if anything ends in itis, it means inflammation. So plantar fasciitis is uh, pain or inflammation in the sole of the foot caused by irritation to your plantar fascia here. Again, it's quite common, particularly in people if they uh, don't aren't wearing the right footwear, if they don't have good arch support on the inside of the foot here. Uh, so that if you have arch support in your foot, it kind of supports this area here. If you don't have arch, uh, adequate footwear, proper footwear, your, the arch of your foot can collapse, putting pressure on this structure here and causing pain and inflammation. Okay, that is literally the last thing I wanted to cover as part of this introduction to anatomy. Over the last 10 lectures, we have gone from head to toe. Uh, you guys have learned how to describe the body, how to uh, describe movement in the body. You've learned about the skeleton, the axial and appendicular skeleton, all the major bones in the body. Uh, we've looked at all the major muscles in the body that are uh, relative to a career in the health and fitness industry. Um, and we have, uh, yeah, then looked at all the muscles, yeah, looked at all the muscles, that's, that, that's it. Now, obviously, there is a huge, uh, there's a lot more anatomy that we haven't covered. Uh, you know, you could add in the vascular system to the body there. We could start to look at all the blood vessels, that's all part of anatomy there. We could add in the respiratory system. There is a lot more to anatomy than what we have just covered uh, in this, uh, this module. But um, hopefully it's given you a, um, it has given you uh, a, a, an introduction in it to, to anatomy. It might have kick-started an interest in anatomy. So, uh, you know, feel free to, to, to take it on, uh, take it on further um, and learn as much as you can. I certainly find it fascinating and I've really enjoyed putting these videos together to help you through it. And uh, I will be more than happy to help you with anything else that you need as you progress through your modules and your degree. Thank you very much for your attention. I will see you in the next one.